So I'm, I'm sure this is all new to you, but I've known Mike for a while. He's a fellow motorcyclist. He rides a Harley, and I think this is extremely appropriate. His license plate says Rev. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, just a little background before Mike gets started. Mike has actually been a missionary. He was a missionary to Romania. And while he was there, he helped plant a church. And then he came back to the States. And he had been pastoring a church for a number of years. And now he's kind of in between trying to figure out well, what's the next calling on his life. But God is going to speak to him. And how is he going to do that? So he's in kind of a search mode. So I'm sure God's going to put him in a place that he's going to just blow it away. Because he's following God's leading. So he's got words for us today, and hopefully uh, everyone here will be blessed by that. And we hope that Mike will be blessed as well. Okay. So Mike, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. You kind of stole some of my thunder here. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, my wife Sandy is here with me as well. Yes, we, we have a Harley in the garage, and we try to keep up with the Christian Motorcycle Association as much as we can. They're going out to Sturgis this week, I think, and they're going without me this this year, so I'm kind of pumped about that. But anyway, yes, we we've been I've been on pastoral staff in Chaska for almost 20 years. We stepped down just last Thanksgiving, and um, a missionary to Romania, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But missionary to Romania, we were church planters there, and, and by God's grace, there's a thriving church in the city of Vitesh, Romania, that we lived in for 10 years yeah, in that city. So. Um, that's a little bit about us. We have three adult children and their families and seven grandkids. Our oldest grandson just graduated from Chaska High School a few weeks ago. So that's, that's a little bit about us. Did I miss anything, sweetheart? Okay. We have a dog named Willow who runs, runs our household. So uh, let's, let's pray as we begin. Lord Jesus, thank you for the time of worship that we have enjoyed this morning, for the, the fellowship that we enjoy as a church family, the fact that you are in our midst by your Holy Spirit, and we, whether we've known each other for five minutes or five years or longer, we can, we can be knit together in our hearts because of the work of your Holy Spirit. We praise you for that this morning. Praise you for your word, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that uh, as, we, as we spend time in your word this morning, that by your Holy Spirit, you would enliven your word, that you would drive it deep into our hearts today. Show us who you are. Take us deeper into our relationship with you and our knowledge of you. So we give this hour to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So it was about this time last year that I led a ministry team to, I, I talked to you about uh, Pitesh, Romania, where Sandy and I, our family, lived for 10 years. That's where our sister church is. And so I led a team there last year. It was about this time and a team of, I think, 21 or 22 people. It was a pretty large team. And as, we, as their team experienced the city there and the, and the church ministry there, it was an incredible time of culture, incredible time of ministry, incredible time of relationship building with believers there and, and our team. It was, it was an amazing time. And God did, God did great things with the, with, as we worked with families from a ghetto in the city that our church has been working with for a long time over there. We spent time with uh, a homeless ministry, and we spent time at a mountain retreat with about, mountains in, in Romania are absolutely beautiful. And so we got to spend time a week up there in the mountains with about 100 kids and adults in a retreat. It was, it was quite, a, quite a privilege for us. One afternoon on, in our time there in, in Pitesh, we are, I took our team down to the, in the city, I took our team down to the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue in the city. And um, it was an educational visit. It is not really part of our ministry scope, but, but uh, that I, in the time that we lived there, we became very good friends with the Jewish community. A small group, 20, 30, 40 people in a city that used to have 800 Jews in it. And uh, I became pretty attached to that community. So when I take a team over there, if you come with me, we're going to go see the Jewish synagogue. I'm going to take you down there because it just means so much to me. And so we went one afternoon to the synagogue, and Domno Davidovich, Domno means mister, so Mr. Davidovich uh, was the director of it, and he seemed pleased and encouraged that we were interested in all things of, of concerning their, their Jewish community. And he welcomed us into the synagogue, and he took us on a tour of the worship center, and he fielded questions from our team. Um, just give you a little bit of background there. Some years ago, if I... 
I could take you back even more years. I, I took another church youth group, primarily a Romanian youth group from our church there, down to the synagogue. We did a service project. And I don't know if you can see it there, but you can see the tops of the benches there, all the benches, wooden benches. We painted all those for them because they were in quite the disrepair. And we, our, our Romanian youth group did all that for them. And um, after we finished the work, the director of the synagogue, his name was Domnul Shobel, um, told us stories about the Jewish community there. And many of them had tattoos on their arms. I told you there used to be 800 people in the Jewish community in Pitesh. Now they're down to about 30, maybe less today. Many of them perished with a whole family history perished in, in the Holocaust. Domhnall Schobel was in Auschwitz along with Domhnall Rosenberg. Oh, I could tell stories. I'm, I'm real tempted to just go start telling stories, but I'll stop there. Um, but Domino Chabelle took us, took that team on the tour of the worship center, and in the front of the room, if you can see it where the yellow lights are there, they had it lit up for us, and you can see the cabinet there where the scrolls are. Domino Chabelle took the, went and unlocked the cabinet that held the Torah scrolls. He brought them down from the cabinet, and he, he uh, put them on a table, and he, he showed the youth group the scrolls. And as I look back on it, at that, I have a picture of it, but I can't find it to save my life. But you get an idea there. One of the, one of the leaders there is, is undoing the scroll for us. And um, they actually rolled it out on the table for us. And as I look back on it, I, I get emotional when I think about it. I realize what a precious moment that was for us in that day, on that day, to see the scripture scrolls unfurled before us. So I was hoping, when I took this team there last year, I was hoping for the same experience. I wanted to go to the synagogue, and I wanted to ask this new group, if, ask Domhnul Dovidovich if he would show the scrolls to our, our group that day, the new director. And after thinking about it for a while, he agreed to show us the scrolls. And then he disappeared to go find the keys. So and when he found the keys, he and I went forward up to the cabinets to retrieve the scrolls. I couldn't wait to show the scrolls to the team. The padlock had not been open for a very long time, and he was trying to, trying to get it to open up, and it finally, finally opened up. And as I think about it, I wonder if maybe our youth group of all those years ago were the last to see the scrolls on display. And at last, the precious scrolls of the Torah were seen there for us. They were out for us to see. And the one is in plain view, and the other is in the shadow of the door, the door that wouldn't open. And it became apparent to me that Domino Davidovich wasn't going to take the scrolls out of the cabinet. And in my ex excitement for the day, I asked a, a very, what I look back on now was a very naive, and if I can use the word stupid, question. And I said, would you like me to take the scrolls out? And the answer came back very quickly, no. And after some negotiations, he agreed to let the team members come up one by one to look at the scrolls, but they were not allowed to touch the scrolls. So I had to stand guard and make sure nobody got very close to the scrolls or could touch them. We later learned that those scrolls are very old and they're very expensive. But that likely pales in comparison to the value they hold as a tradition. And I now realize that as a Gentile, I would never be able to handle those scrolls. I'm not Jewish. I'm not a rabbi. I'm not even a member of the Jewish community. I had no authority to handle those scrolls. They were not to be treated as tourist curiosities. And I'm not sure Domino Davidovich thought that he had the authority either. He's not a rabbi, and he never takes them out of the cabinet. I think, I, I think it's a serious thought that maybe our, our youth group was the last one to see it all those years ago. He only reads a Romanian version of the Torah. And it seems to me that nobody in that room, nobody in that community had the authority to handle those precious scrolls of the Torah, the very word of God. In our re questions regarding the Jewish community, we learned that there are very few members anymore. I mentioned they're down to about 30. The Jewish holidays are sparsely attended. They don't even use the worship center. They just meet in the office. Domno Davidovich said that many of the Jews had intermarried outside the faith and, and therefore the Jewish faith was becoming lost in the mix. 
Faith was giving way to the concerns and the passions of life. So the scrolls stay in the cabinet. I can't help but wonder what authority those those scrolls have in the lives of the Jewish community. So I hope my skepticism is unfounded, but I fear that it's not. In the Gospel of Mark, which we'll be looking at today, we come to one of the early teaching opportunities for Jesus, Mark chapter 1. And it's in a synagogue. And this, this time, the scrolls were not behind a padlock, a rusty old padlock, but they were out in center stage for all to see. In the synagogue of Jesus' day, the scrolls were the foundation for their truth, this foundation for their authority and their teaching and their wisdom. And the Jewish community gathered there in that community uh, regularly to hear the Torah read and to hear it taught or instructed. And so enter Jesus into the synagogue. And as he taught that day, the question of authority immediately presented itself. Those who heard were astonished not only at the teaching, but at the authority with which Jesus presented himself. For them, it was a new paradigm that day, a paradigm that rocked their world. And for us, the authority of Jesus may be an assumption that has ceased to amaze and challenge us, I wonder. It also occurs to me that in his authority, Jesus may not seem safe to us, Or in his authority, he may seem like a harsh taskmaster imposing strict rules or directions for us. His authority may impinge on our autonomy and our freedom to set our own direction, our desires and values for our lives. So that day and today, the question of authority surfaces our true perspective of who God is. So as we look at this this incident in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, The author, Mark, wants to shatter our assumptions and lead us back to the astonishment at the authority of Jesus over all of creation and us. So I'd like to go and and visit Mark chapter 1 today. If you would, if you have your Bible with me, and I hope with you, and I hope you do, turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Let me just read our text for us this morning. I'll start at verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And passing alongside the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Look again at at verse 21. We'll spend some time here. I'm sorry, verse... 22, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Uh, verse 21 says, they went into Capernaum. Okay, a little quiz for you this morning. This has nothing to do with anything. How many of you know how to pronounce Capernaum? How many of you say Capernaum? I say Capernaum. We're all wrong. We're all wrong. So this is free. This is free. No charge for this. The correct pronunciation is Capernaum. I'm going, to stay, I'm going to stick with Capernaum because it's a little easier to roll off the tongue a little easier, but that just freebie today. 
So if you would indulge me for just a moment, I'd like to take this opportunity for a little travel log and put some context around this passage in Mark. In Luke's Gospel, we learn that Jesus had been teaching in synagogues throughout the region of Galilee, and that's in northwestern Israel. He came to his hometown of Nazareth and went into the synagogue. That was his custom. And if you remember the famous inaugural scene of his ministry, Jesus took the scroll in that scene and he read from Isaiah 61. And that, on that day, they were astonished at his teaching and his authority. But as he proclaimed Isaiah 61 and said, this is fulfilled in my presence, in your presence, they got angry with him. And if you remember right, they tried to, to do away with him. And so he left. And he went to Capernaum, about 30 miles away. About five years ago, a group of us had the privilege of standing on Mount Arbel, looking over the Sea of Galilee. If you can see, that's, that's where we stood, our group, uh, our tourist group, about 45, 50 of us that day, gathered in that very spot. And um, if I can show you a little bit, just to get your bearings. Capernaum is right up here. So we were looking at Capernaum, and if you... If you look over your left shoulder, as you look at the picture, Galilee is behind your left shoulder. It's about 30 miles difference. And uh, just to give you some context, on Mount Arbel, we, we discussed the ministry of Jesus and his authority as it was displayed for all to see in, those, in these circumstances. We could literally see a panorama of the places that he walked, the places where he proclaimed the gospel, where he proclaimed his identity, even the demon knew that he was the Holy One of God, and he proclaimed the gospel. It was in this passage of Mark 1 that we did our devotions on Mount Arbel that morning, looking out over that scene. I can't describe to you what a special time that was for us. So Mark tells us that Jesus entered the synagogue in Capernaum, and he began to teach. So the synagogue in Capernaum was the central meeting place. You'll see a picture of what it looks like today. And then there's another slide that has what it looked like back in the day. You'll see it in just a moment. Everybody gathered there for worship, for the reading of the Torah, for teaching, and to pass on the faith to the next generation. It's, it's not unlike what we do as a church today. Uh, I, I just wonder if they had a CE program or family nights out at, at the synagogue. And as we see throughout the whole New Testament, the synagogue is key to the Jewish community. Both Jesus and the apostles often made the synagogue their first stop in a city. It was at the synagogue that they would find God-fearers, that they would find people who were familiar with the Torah and people who were familiar and disposed to the very word of God. There's no rusty padlocks in those synagogues guarding the Torah scrolls. Mark doesn't really tell us what Jesus was teaching on that day. It seems to be in, in Mark's version here, it seems to be secondary to what he's actually trying to communicate to us about Jesus. But it's safe to assume <coughs> that his teaching was on the kingdom of God. If you look at verse 15, he comes into, the, into the, the, the synagogue and says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus boldly proclaimed the kingdom of God and its arrival in his person. When he's there, the kingdom of God is there. So he may have repeated his reading for proclamation from Isaiah 61 as he did in Nazareth. We're not sure. And Mark doesn't seem to want to tell us. It's secondary to his scope that day. Going back to verse 22, it says this, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. My English Standard Version, ESV, uses the word astonished to describe the response of the people that day. Other versions use words such as amazed or astounded. And I don't think we give this the weight that it deserves. We just drive by it too quickly, too quickly when we're reading the gospel. The definition of the original language, I, the, the idea here has so much more to it. It means to be beside yourself. It means to be overwhelmed. It doesn't mean simply to be astonished. It means to be greatly astonished. Now, I'm, I'm making the assumption here today that you're going to leave very astonished at my preaching today. You'll probably be astonished that your pastor let me preach here today. That's probably what the real story is. 
But on my best day, on my best day, I can't come close to the response that was elicited by Jesus that day. He left them speechless. He left them not knowing how to respond. It was not only his teaching, and I say this over and over again, it wasn't just his teaching, it was his mere presence standing before them. They must have realized that this authority that they were experiencing was not just for that moment, for that place, not just for them, but, it was, but something greater was in their midst. At our camp last year, several of our team members gave testimonies to the ghetto kids and the, and the, and the families of Romania. And it was a, a vivid reminder to me of the power of our Christian testimony, our faith testimony. It was amazing how God used them in their stories for the ministry that week. And I had my granddaughter on the team, and she was able to share her testimony in the very church that we helped to plant in Romania. That was, that was very moving for me as well. Our friend Jennifer Phibbs, a member of the team that year, also shared her story. Her struggle, uh, and she's in her 50s probably, I'm not sure her age, um, never asked her. I don't intend to ask her what her age is, but um, she told her story. Her story includes a struggle with her identity as a, as a child and as a, as a teenage girl, a struggle with identity, a struggle with her worth, her personal worth, all confused by overt sexual abuse by an uncle as she was growing up. I there are probably 65 kids between the, eight and, between the ages of 8 and 15 sitting in the room. It was a camp setting. They were squirrely. They were running around trying to get them to sit down after we had a lively time of worship. And um, now they're all sitting down, but they're, they're squirrely. They're jabbing each other, and they're talking. And Jennifer's standing up to give her testimony, and she starts to speak in a quiet voice and describes who she is, and she starts, she starts in on her story. And as she talks, she begins to talk about the sexual abuse that she experienced as a girl. And the tears flowed down her face. And you could see the pain that she still lives with today, even though that she, he, she has dealt with it all these years. But what, I don't know if she knew it, or, but I knew it. Many of those kids in that room that day suffer from sexual and, and, and abuse and abuse of various forms. Some of them are even sold by their parents into prostitution. They come from a horrible, horrible situation. And as she began to share her story, and the tears ran down her face, those squirrely, rowdy kids all of a sudden sat down and began to listen. You could hear a pin drop in that room. You could hear a pin drop. It was truly amazing. One young boy sitting next to me, um, a couple rows up, I'm guessing 12, 13 years old, got up and left the room. He couldn't, couldn't take the story. Who knows what his story was? They were astonished at her testimony that day. On Sunday, we were back at the church, and a young lady from uh, another church, we had two churches on our team, and I didn't know her very well, and so I didn't know her story. Her name was Rachel. Her name is Rachel. And she shared her story at the at church service that morning. I had no idea what was coming. As she laid her life, her heart, and her struggles out for all to see, at times she was unable to speak for the pain that she was speaking out to us and the hurt. It got so that she couldn't speak, and somebody, one of her team members, came up and, and just embraced her on the stage. And she spoke of God's goodness and grace in the midst of very, very difficult times. Again, you could hear a pin drop. Everyone in the room was astonished at what she was telling us. Those are powerful testimonies and moments, but they don't compare to the astonishment that the people in Capernaum experienced that day. They didn't see it coming either. This itinerant rabbi just blew them away, to use our terminology today. The audience in Capernaum that day was greatly astonished. But I'll say it again, it wasn't just his teaching that overwhelmed them. It was the authority behind it. So let's talk about that authority. 
If I were to say to you this morning that Jesus has authority over all things, I might get an amen from you. For a moment, it may draw us into worship of his greatness as we consider his authority. But then again, I step back and I wonder if we don't take these truths for granted today. If the astonishment has somewhat worn off about Jesus, the authority of Jesus. But for the people in the, in the synagogue in Capernaum, they were seeing Jesus in this light for the very first time. And what did they see? What left them astonished? Again, in verse 22, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. But again, Mark didn't tell us very much about what he was teaching. They were astonished at his teaching, but why didn't Mark say, well, this is what he taught that day? Because they were astonished at his authority. And that's what Mark is getting at. And it says that they're, they're, his teaching was not the same as the scribes who taught the Torah in that day. Now, scribes were the teachers of the day. It was their job to interpret and teach the Torah, God's word, the scrolls. It was their job to interpret them for the people. And they relied heavily, the, the, the scribes relied heavily on tradition to understand the Torah. So you would hear the scribes say often, well, it has been said, because that was the foundation of their teaching. They often referred to other teachers and other traditions to interpret the scriptures. One commentator said this about their, their, their view of the scripture and thinking it has been said, they're relying on everybody else, said, you know what? Originality in understanding the scripture was not their forte. They stuck with what had been passed down to them. They relied heavily on other teachers. And eventually, schools of thought boiled down into two groups, liberal and conservative, among the rabbis. And any authority in teaching was derived from the expertise of other rabbis in these traditions. But listen, Mark is telling us that Jesus wasn't like that. He didn't teach like they did. He didn't quote other teachers. He didn't speculate on a passage. He didn't make assumptions about something. And as the author of Scripture, he, he spoke with the authority of God in all things. Can you think of some examples that would reflect this? I, I, as I think about it, he said in, in Mark 1.15, we read it earlier, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. That's authority. He didn't, go, he didn't say somebody else said you should do that. I say you should do that. In the, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five, verses, chapter 5 to 7, he said things like, blessed are you. Blessed are you. He can speak that with authority. He said, well, you've heard it said. But what did he always follow that up with? You've heard it said. But I say to you, and I have the last word on this. But I say to you. Luke chapter 13, he says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's authority. And, and as he described the kingdom of heaven all through the Gospels, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like, and again, not relying on somebody else's opinion, but from his firsthand experience, from his authority, the kingdom of heaven is like. There's another way that his authority is seen in this situation, and maybe another time we can discuss this second part a little more in depth. But what happened during the time that he was teaching? What does the text tell us? Somebody, somebody help me. What happened while he was teaching? Anybody? A, go ahead. A demon came out. Somebody in the synagogue. Somebody in the synagogue. I mean, think about that. Somebody in the synagogue stood up and they were demon-possessed and the demon spoke to Jesus. And what did he say? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. I know your authority. Don't cast me out. He knew the authority of Jesus while everybody else was just kind of getting used to this idea. And what did Jesus do? Okay, a little background. Some... In the, in the tradition of the day, in the practice of the day, some were, 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 were good at casting out demons. One of the ways that you could cast out a demon in that day was to put a putrid herb up the nose of somebody who's demon-possessed, and maybe the putrid smell would drive the demon away. 
Okay, that's one method, I guess. They, had, um, they would call on greater demons to remove the lesser demons. Seems like that would be a rotation that you just wouldn't get out of. But that was one way to do it. Um, another way was just through incantations and things like that and ceremonies to drive the demons away. But Jesus wasn't like that. He showed an authority over demons that no one had ever seen. He simply said, be quiet and come out of him. Just a simple word of his mouth made the demon cower and leave. So we go back to verse 27. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. But don't miss this. It wasn't the submission of the demon that was astonishing. It was the authority of Jesus that made them overwhelmed with wonder. An exorcism would certainly get my attention, but it paled in comparison to the authority that Jesus was showing that day. In Matthew chapter 12, just a little bit of an aside building on this idea, in Matthew 12, Jesus made three comparisons of himself to the Old Testament authorities. He compared himself to the authority of the temple. He compared himself to the preaching of Jonah. And he compared himself to the wisdom of Solomon. And if you go back to Matthew 12, in each of those comparisons, he ended that comparison by saying, but something greater is here in your midst. That day in Capernaum, they looked beyond the teaching, they looked beyond the exorcism, and they realized that something greater was in their midst. So let me ask you a question this morning. When was the last time you were left speechless, overwhelmed, overcome by the authority of Jesus? When was the last time you ste stepped back and thought to yourself, there is something greater here? So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Seems our... This is probably a news flash this morning, but I, I, I'm thinking that our culture doesn't like the idea of authority. We question it, we struggle against it, and we reject it. We fight for our, our autonomy on every occasion. We demand our rights, and if, if we do, if somebody does have authority over us, it's oftentimes conditional, and it's only for certain circumstances or temporary. We second-guess authority, and, and usually we think we know better than any authority over us. I've never personally done anything like that, but I know that there are people who do that. That was a joke. <laughs> okay, okay. We yield to authority only if it's in our best interest, only if we can control the relationship or if we're forced to. Submitting to authority doesn't come easily to us. But Jesus steps onto the world stage and he declares that the kingdom of God is here and with the announcement is a call to repent and to believe the gospel. And Jesus comes with all the authority of God and all the authority of heaven. He declares himself to be the great I am, capital letters. He declares himself to be in, in the I am, the immovable, the non-negotiable, the ultimate authority in all of creation. He declares God as his Father. He has authority over all circumstances. He has authority over the heavenly realm. He has authority over sickness. He has authority over our calling, over our nature. He has, he has authority over our rulers. His authority comes directly from God because he is God. His authority is seen in his teaching. It's ex he has exhibited power and his proclaimed truth. He comes seeking our compliance to his leadership and his authority. But then again, to come back, how do we view authority? We see it often abused. We see human leaders who have broken trust with us. We are skeptical that authorities have our best interest in mind. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus says the rulers of this world lord their leadership over others and they call for subservience. And all through history, human rulers have demanded our obedience even at times our worship. And so sometimes, <clears throat> as I think this through, we transfer that frustration, we transfer that skepticism or that fear, or that mistrust of leadership over to the Lord Jesus. Authority becomes a concept for us to be cautious of. 
It very much impacts how we view God. Do we see him as a, di- a dictator? Do we even see him as a benevolent dictator? Do we, see him as, do we see him as intimate or do we see him as distant? Do we see him as caring or do we see him as indifferent? Do we see him as selfish, even petty in his demands? That he is somehow coercing us to comply to, to worship him? You see, how we view his authority is, is a reflection of our view of who he is. But I want you to consider this morning how God operates. He created us with a free will, knowing that we have the choice to refuse his goodness and to refuse his authority. He created us so that we would freely love him and yield ourselves to his authority, knowing that he cares for us and that he is the source of true life. Far from a wicked, selfish dictator, God is consistently offering grace and second chances even in our failures. Instead of force, God woos his people to come enjoy the life he offers. In his authority and even in his wrath and his judgment, he exhibits a patience, a long suffering until it is simply no longer possible. I have some some scripture verses to, to consider as we close this morning. Consider the Lord's authority. Consider his leadership in our lives and his invitation to follow after him. In Matthew chapter 11, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen to the invitation. I will give you rest. What does he say about God? He says he is gentle, he is lowly in heart. When we are yoked with Jesus, he calls us to serve him and to serve with him. But it is his strength, it's his wisdom that bears the burden, not us and not our resources. Unlike our concept of authority, Jesus is a safe leader. He is a, his authority is for our good and for our life in him. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said it like this, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Greatness in God's kingdom is based on humility, not arrogance or pride. Those who are great in his kingdom seek to emulate him. Humility is at the heart of his character. He can only work in the lives of those who are willing to set aside self and come humbly under his authority. Matthew chapter 16. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whatever, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The call to kingdom life is a call to self-denial, of putting our own ego aside to submit to his authority. But Jesus isn't calling us to anything that he hasn't practiced already and given us an example of. In his authority as God, he can call on anyone and anyone and anything for his own pleasure, yet he chooses to come as a, hel- a humble servant without even a place to lay his head. Jesus is safe in his authority and his calling. Matthew chapter 20. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you remember the story, James and John, the disciples came to Jesus seeking positions of authority. Actually, they sent their mom in to ask him. They wanted positions of authority in his kingdom. And so Jesus, he didn't chastise them for their desire to serve in his kingdom. No, he didn't do that. Seeking positions of leadership and influence in the kingdom can simply be a desire to, to, to serve God all the more. What Jesus wanted to emphasize was the kind of leadership he was calling for. It's a servanthood. If you want to lead, you have to be willing to serve. And Jesus took it further. He said you need to be a slave to those you serve. And he gave the example of himself. In all of his authority, he didn't come to serve, to be served, but to serve. Now, in Capernaum that day, they didn't know any of that. They just knew that there was something greatly astounding with this man. His authority was beyond anything they could have imagined. They were overwhelmed. They were astonished with the authority with which he spoke. 
when we consider the authority of Jesus and the path that he has chosen for us, we need to be astounded as well. He came to serve. He came to lead us. He came to bear our burdens. He came to show us kingdom life. He came that we might have life to the full. So when we face choices in our life that would lead us away from his truth, that lead us away from his grace, lead us away from his life, we need to remember that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And whenever we choose the world's wisdom over his wisdom, we set ourselves on a path away from his authority and toward difficulty and destruction. When we demand our way instead of coming under his authority, we need not be surprised if a mess lies before us. All we need to do is read the headlines of the day. And we see what it means to reject his authority. Whether it's government, whether it's transgenderism, whether it's abortion or the breakdown in marriage, just fill in all the trends that you see around you. And, they're, and at the root of all the confusion, at the root of all the rebellion and the chaos is a turning away from the authority of Jesus. We saw it on full display with the Olympic ceremony the other night. So as I close this morning, let's just, let's just talk personal. Where are you today? Is God a safe God? Do you trust his authority? Are you willing to submit to him? Maybe we hide behind our good behavior. Maybe we hide behind our, our solid doctrine, all in a, a fear of actually giving ourselves over to him. Do you have the faith and the courage today to pray, Lord, examine my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me? Can we, can we submit to his authority and can we pray with conviction this morning, I'll heed your wisdom, I'll go where you lead, I'll give over all I have withheld, I'll give you all that I have, and I will walk in submission to your authority. Can you pray that this morning? Is today the day as we think about his authority in our lives is maybe today, maybe today is the day to give over that one thing that you've been holding back and say, Jesus, I know you love me and I know your wisdom and your word is there for me, but I want to give this thing over to your authority today for you to work it out. And if, now again, I've never done anything like that, but only every day. God is always calling us to give over something else that we refuse to give. Will you submit to his authority today and say, yes, Lord, I'll go there with you. Amen. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Lord Jesus, we, we take a fresh look at Mark chapter 1 and we see what happened in Capernaum and and the, and the astonishment at your authority, just your mere presence, the mere speaking of your word, commanded demons and brought out your word with, with absolute authority. And Lord, we, we sometimes take that for granted. We're surrounded by it and we, and we read in your scripture and sometimes we drive by it too fast. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that the, in the coming days, this week ahead of us, that, that we would be astonished by your authority and that it's accompanied by your love and your grace. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you find us as your people willing to turn over our lives, turn over those hidden things, those things that we, in our imagination, think that we can hold back from you. Lord, may you find us submitting to your authority this week, walking in your wisdom, walking in the power of your Holy Spirit, confessing sin, giving over those things that don't belong to you, and walking in the fullness of life that you have for us. We give ourselves over to you this morning. We do it with, with praise and adoration and glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.